Hello there, Dr. Dan Guerra from VeraMed Studios in the American Northwest. Today, St. Joseph's Day, the 19th of March, 2018, we're going to talk about a general topic, but we're still going to be looking at neuronal circuitry. So we're still up at the neuropsychiatric uh, axis of our discussions. We've talked a lot about drugs of abuse. We talked about marijuana, ethanol, opiates. And last time we talked on St. Patrick's Day, we talked about cocaine a little bit. Today, we're not going to talk about drug abuse, but we're going to talk about modification of proteins within the central nervous system and how that modification plays a role in how signaling and processing of neural information occurs. So let us get started, shall we? All right. So note that I have everything in red today. Now, I, I said I was going to do this well, on St. Patrick's Day, which was only 48 hours ago. The reason I'm doing everything in red is because, as I mentioned, this is the feast day of St. Joseph's for us Catholics. And why that matters to me is that St. Patrick's Day always overshadows St. Joseph's Day because I grew up in the south side of Chicago. And Chicago was quite the Irish town when I grew up. In fact, we had an uh, Irish mayor named Richard Daly, and um, he was the one, I think, that started uh, dyeing the uh, Chicago River green. So I think all, some of you internationally know that that's what happens in Chicago. So believe me, it's a very, very Irish town. And I went to a school, a parochial school called St. Christina, um, that was uh, predominantly Irish kids. And so being an Italian, having an Italian surname and being an Italian, I was uh, in the minority. And so when St. Joseph's Day came about two days later, only a few of us, uh, you know, celebrated it. And it was always like sort of um, our way of, of um, you know, sticking it to the Irish. And so I can't let that go, even uh, since that you know happened so long ago. And um, so I'm, I'm doing it today. Uh, St. Joseph's color is red. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. You know, the uh, St. Patrick's Day is green, right, for Irish. Well, this is red, and that's why everything is in red. Okay, so I'm done with all of that accounting of uh, my past and, and why I'm doing this, so let's just get going. Today, as I've mentioned, we're going to talk about protein modification and how it controls neuronal physiology. Um, this is me, Dan Guerra. There's my uh, specific email address. You can contact me about any of these uh, lectures and ask me information about them. Um, you can also uh, critique them any way you want to. And you could even ask me to come up with new topics that you might like me to cover. Uh, I'm always open to suggestions. In fact, a lot of the topics I cover come from suggestions. Um, okay, so um, our company is Vera Med. It's normally not in this red tone. It's normally in a much different color pattern, but it's red today for the holiday. Uh, this is our website, and that is our email address. So you can contact me either via direct email or via the email through the website. We're a company that consults using scientific literature. So the topics that I cover on these free lectures, these YouTube lectures, are just ones that interest me or, as I said, interest people uh, that have come forward and talked to me about it. Um, and they would not be the kind of thing or the sole thing that we would do with our clients. What we do with our clients is one-on-one -on -one discussion of what they want us to look into in the scientific literature. And not only look into it, look at the evidence, uh, compare that evidence to what is foundational and coherent in all the other scientific literature, and then explain it um, in whatever terms a person is necessary to understand it at. So we work with physicians, we work with veterinarians, we work with lawyers, uh, we work with other health professionals, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, and lay people, of course, is another general and very specific part of the clientele. All right. Uh, picture taken, of course, in uh, Utah. And uh, I, we go to Utah a lot, and that's one of my photographs. All right. So proteins can be modified via covalent attachment of various organic molecules. This can occur reversibly or actually in terms of the cell lifespan of the protein irreversibly. Function of those modifications is quite complex, but it involves numerous trafficking phenomena. That is movement of the protein around, signaling, uh, tariffing, um, absorption, regulation, even degradation, that kind of trafficking. 
The modification is controlled by genetic and environmental cues. And by environmental, I want to add in epigenetic phenomenon. And we'll get into that in a while. Now, <clears throat> one such kind of covalent modification is glycosylation, simply the attachment of sugars. But the statement is simple, but there's nothing simple about glycosylation. Because you have any number of different glycotypes of proteins. You can have one polypeptide backbone, but you can have multiple ways that protein can be decorated with carbohydrate. And it's decorated covalently, so these attachments withstand uh, perhaps the entire life of the cell in which that occurred, or like I said, sometimes it involves turnover of the protein. Here's just a, a kind of a, a brief look at the kinds of sugar ornamentation proteins can have. Here's the human uh, immunoglobulin M. Now these different color codings here are for the different sugars. Uh, and and acetyl uh, glutamate, mannose, galactose, and acetyl neuraminic acid, fucose. These are all different sugars that are attached in various kinds of bonding patterns. One four, alpha 1,4, beta 1,4, alpha 1,3, beta 1,3, uh, et cetera. And you can get an idea of the complexity of the way these sugars are attached. Though, so that's a human IgM, there's a chicken ovalbumin, and synbivirus, human and rabbit transferrin protein, protein that moves around iron, vesicular stomatitis virus, yes, viruses become glycosylated when they're in the host. There's IgG, you see IgG is much different than IgM, IgM being associated with the membrane, IgG being secreted. Uh, um, uh, heads up, that's how proteins get secreted. Part of the trafficking through the plasma membrane is how they glycosylated. And this all involves then uh, very tight security in terms of the regulation of glycosylation. I'll show you a um, stochastic view of that in a moment. Uh, and then there's bovine immunoglobulin G, which looks different from human immunoglobulin, as you can see. All right, so that's just an idea. Okay. So to, to just give you a little bit about carbohydrate addition, you have the carbohydrate being added to a protein covalently to specific amino acid groups that are part of a sequence that uh, allow for the movement of that carbohydrate to that covalent bond. Okay, so that's how it's recognized. The protein is a primary structure, the amino acid sequence. That amino acid sequence is um, detected by the enzymes that are going to add the sugars to those specific regions of specific amino acids so that you have a very specific pattern of glycosylation based, again, on the primary structure of the protein. So therefore, it is genetically controlled and indeed also epigenetically controlled. Now, it's not simply taking a carbohydrate like a free sugar, like say glucose, or even a phosphorylated sugar like uh, fructose 6-phosphate. No, the sugars are activated by attaching to a prenolipid called dolichol. In fact, dolichol is synthesized via the de novo cholesterologenesis pathway. So heads up on that, when people take statins, statins inhibit the hmg coi reductase step of colon, uh, cholesterologenesis, which is at the very, almost the very beginning of the reactions. I've covered this in previous lectures. Now, why is that significant? We don't really know what statins do to the levels of dolichol, but I can tell you dolichol is very important because it's the carrier molecule for adding carbohydrate to all the proteins that become glycosylated. And there are a great number of proteins that become glycosylated in their lifespan. And many of them, in fact, are the ones that are the receptors that involve all the trafficking and signaling that cells do and also the fate of the cell. So this is a um, diagram from a textbook from a, one of the biochemistry books that I've used when I teach biochemistry, general biochem or graduate biochem for, for students, med students, et cetera. Uh, let's take a look at it real quickly. So I want you to notice that, okay, so for those of you that remember this, I'm glad, but many of you don't know this at all, but let me tell you that protein synthesis or translation occurs with messenger RNA, with ribosomal RNA, with transfer RNA, and, it, and of course, with free amino acids that are attached to that transfer RNA, so accepting ARM, and then the enzymes responsible for carrying out all those procedures, the translation of machinery. Now, translation for proteins can occur in two places in eukaryotic cells, roughly said in the cytoplasm and roughly uh, on polyribosomes, and then on the endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, the rough ER or the RER, for those of you that remember this from uh, college or high school days, right? The rough ER, that's what we're looking at here. So here's where Dolichol comes in. Dolichol becomes phosphorylated twice 
by look at this using nucleotides. So this is actually linked to nucleotide metabolism. Much of sugar metabolism, once you leave standard oxidation reactions, uh, uh, involves nucleotide sugars. That's a topic of another uh, lecture sometime. Anyway, you you, bit, you, pho you phosphorylate delicol twice. You make delicol pyrophosphate. Then you start adding the sugars, and the sugars themselves are activated by nucleotides. So you, start, you start adding on here. You can see here is glucose, and then acetylglucosamine and mannose, which is just an example. And so you start adding the sugars to specific locations because of enzymatic reactions. And then when you make a core glycosylation, then that whole, that whole uh, delicol pyrophosphate flips over. So this is a biophysical effect of having these sugars and then transmembrane movement of, that's why you have this isoprene unit here because it's working within the membrane of the ER. Your entire molecule flips over and now you start adding more sugars, right? Here you got more sugars uh, that are nucleotide sugars being added to the delicol pyrophosphate, start building what we call the tree, the glycan tree, and onward and onward using nucleotide sugars, sometimes UDP, sometimes GDP. Ultimately, depending on how many steps and what the pattern of glycosylation is, you make then the final pattern for the glycosylation. Now, this can be pruned and it can be added to and the bonds can be shifted around. So it's much more complex than this simple uh, rote glycosylation pattern, but you get the idea. Now, proteins that are being synthesized on the rough ER shown here, right, this polypeptide tail with these specific amino acid residues and only those amino acid residues will become glycosylated with the finished glycan tree. So it'll be removed from the delicol, delicol pyrophosphate and now linked covalently to the protein as the protein's being synthesized from the ribosomal machinery on the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, this looks very exotic, perhaps for those of you who think that proteins are just synthesized willy-nilly in the cytoplasm on polyribosomes, but it's not. It's very sophisticated. It's also extremely common. So all the proteins that get secreted from the cell have a glycosylation pattern. Just about all the proteins that end up in the membrane system of the cell, including the plasma membrane, like all the receptors, have some kind of glycosylation pattern. So this is a fate of a lot of polypeptides in the cell. Very, very common. Note, Dolical pyrophosphate is needed. I told you dolical comes from the isoprenoid pathway. If you inhibit that with a statin, we don't really know what happens to the steady state levels of dolical and whether or not this whole machinery could be corrupted chronically over time. And if it did, changing perhaps the entire protein glycosylation pattern in very subtle ways that wouldn't be picked up unless someone was doing a glycoproteome. Not many of those around. So just giving you a heads up. All right, now that was glycosylation. So let's just move on. This is more of a survey than it is, you know, except at the end we're going to talk about a very specific um, patterning of covalent modification. But here's another kind of modification using a protein called ubiquitin. Ubiquitin is ubiquitous in nature, and what it does is it is added to proteins. So first it's added to an enzymatic machinery complex. This is all thioester chemistry, so it's probably very ancient. You've heard me talk about this before. Thioester machinery rather than oxygen ester machinery is probably much older in terms of the evolution of biochemical pathways. Anyway, it takes a, lot, a bit of energy. You need ATP to be able to make this bond here, to, making this uh, uh, thioester bond here with this carbonyl. You then move this entire ubiquitin molecule to now the next enzyme complex. Now you have the E2 complex of the ubiquitin pathway. And then finally, you have what's called here, uh, rather romantically, the condemned protein, right? Ready for the chopping block. And this condemned protein, it's condemned because of its sequence. Again, it's specific sequence. And that, of course, is entailed and it, it is embedded in its gene sequence, right? In the DNA sequence. So all proteins have that signature DNA sequence. They all end up having the right RNA, and, unless there are mutations or spice variations, et cetera. And then, indeed, finally, when the protein is made, that protein signature, that sequence of the protein, not the composition, ultimately also can designate its final fate. That's really important because proteins turn over not all in the same way. They turn over according to their primary sequence. So some uh, enzymes, for example, can have a half-life of 10 hours, 20 hours in a cell. Some of them have 30 minutes, right? So that means you need nation synthesis of that protein to get it to be functioning again, say in a metabolic pathway, or let's say in transcription, or let's say in some kind of signal transduction that could involve transcription translation or even DNA replication, repair, or recombination. So this is a very insignificant thing, right? 
Uh, ultimately, when you ubiquitate a protein at the, at the lysine residue, you add polyubiquitin, and you keep on adding more and more ubiquitin to it. There's a certain amount of ubiquitin that gets added, and that, again, is a signature statement for the protein, and it gets sent into the proteasome and degraded. Once it's degraded, you've taken that out of whatever pathway it was in. This is a common pathway, not the not a universal, not all proteins get ubiquitated. In fact, ubiquitinylation sometimes doesn't kill a protein. Sometimes it just alters its activity or sequesters it. But I'm just showing you the paradigmatic ubiquitinylation, ultimately leading to the degradation of protein via proteasome. I'm not showing you a proteasome pathway, of course. Not the point of the talk. Now, just going back now to, we're talking about the sequence of the proteins, all the proteins in the cell. Um, this has been studied to some extent, and very interestingly, depending on what the N terminus of the protein is, what amino acid is on that N terminus, remember proteins are, they have an N terminus and a carboxy terminus. N terminus is the first amino acid added to translation, carboxy the last, usually, unless there are uh, post-translational modifications, which can occur. Um, stabilizing for the first amino acid are these, methionine, serine, alanine, etc., destabilizing, giving you, remember I told you 20 hour half-life, very long, greater than 20 hours, okay? Destabilizing, having this branch chain amino acid, isoleucine, having this aromatic tyrosine, having glutamine or glutamate, very short, right? 30 minutes, 10 minutes, and then highly destabilizing, look at this, uh, more aliphatic or, or hydrophobic amino acids, phenylalanine, leucine, lysine, arginine, loose uh, aspartic acid, which is, that doesn't fit the role because that's certainly a charged amino acid. But look at this, three-minute half-life or two-minute half-life in the cell. I mean, it's outrageous. So that's just because of what is the first amino acid on that protein. That's how quickly it's going to be uh, degraded because it's an unstable polypeptide just because of that first amino acid, which, of course, is part and parcel to its sequence. Okay, so that's an idea of what ubiquitin, uh, about what can happen to proteins because of their sequence. And I showed you the covalent modification ubiquitin. Okay, so let's go back to be more general. What do we mean by po uh, post-translational modification? I mean, okay, addition of groups or proteolytic di digestion of specific sequences to make the finished product protein. Common chemical modifications, it's not always post-translational, sometimes it's co-translational. You saw that with the glycosylation pattern. Also, it sometimes happens with meristylation of proteins, that is a C14 fatty acid, usually added to a glycine residue at the end terminus. Okay, so common chemical modifications include methylation, acetylation, we're going to highlight that later, glycosylation, you saw that, phosphorylation, that's very central, very dogmatic. You know that you have these kinase cascades. I've talked about them in all the lectures. In fact, I was counting the lectures. I think I'm up to over 53 now lectures that I've taped uh, and recorded and put up, uh, tapes an old term, of course, that electronically and digitized and put onto YouTube and is out there on my Facebook uh, for Fair I've Med. At any rate, uh, we talk a lot about phosphorylation because phosphorylation cascades are how uh, communication occurs in the cell. And that communication can deal with shifting of metabolic paradigms, metabolic pathways, can talk about whether or not a cell goes through uh, autophagy or apoptosis or senescence or necrosis, right? Talks about how proteins are signaled on the surface so that immune responses occur. So phosphorylation cascades have a tremendous effect and they get a lot of press time with proteins. And we've talked about it. But these other uh, covalent modifications are just as significant. They're just not as uh, common, I guess you could say. And also not as well characterized. Acylation, that's adding a fatty acid. Prenylation, that's adding an isoprene group. Uh, and glypiation, that's adding a gly glycolipid, an entire glycolipid, such as, um, oh, inositol phosphate, for example, or, or that is uh, inositol glycerol phosphate, right? The entire lipid. All right. So what are the functions of post-translational modification? We talked about it already. Targeting, like where the protein ends up. So there is a vectorial transfer of proteins because of their pattern of post-translational modification. Stability, not just what amino acid sequence, but it can stabilize a protein by glycosylating it or can destabilize it. All depends on the very specific structure, right? One protein at a time. Generalizations are very, very detrimental in biochemistry and in biology in general. You'll see that at the end of this talk, hopefully. But I say it all the time, and it's true, because every time we look, we think we understand paradigms in cell, and then we find out, wow, well, there is an exception here, an exception there. You got to be very careful about making that huge induction every time you observe something, just for just saying, right? 
But stability is important. Stability can be uh, imparted by post-translational modification. Novel appropriation, that's my term for saying modifying what the protein does. So let's say the protein's an enzyme, let's say in the oxidative pentose phosphate shunt, uh, and like it's a transketolase enzyme. Uh, but if you modify that transketolase with, with post-translational covalent modification, you can turn the transketolase into a transcription factor, okay? Totally different function just by altering uh, the ornamentation of the protein. And that can turn over very rapidly, actually, within minutes, in fact. So sometimes, in fact, for years and decades, we didn't even know this was happening because it happens fast. It's only until we got better techniques in proteomics that we've been able to determine, wow, lots of things are going on at the post-translational level. And then, of course, attenuation. That is either sequestering the protein so it's not functional uh, for some time. So the amphibolic nature, you can put a protein uh, in, the, say, the cytosol, but it has to work in the mitochondria, or put it in the ER, and it normally works in the peroxyl, that kind of thing. Uh, and attenuation can also mean complete degradation, like with uh, the ubiquitin inhalation and uh, proteosomal degradation, etc. Okay, so here, another way of looking at it, here are some of the modifications, acylation, what happens to just the chemistry of the protein, you lose that positive charge of the amino group, and it also increases the hydrophobicity. Um, I first noted that when I was postdocing uh, in the United States Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Research Service, way back in the day in Peoria, Illinois, where I worked at a regional research laboratory. And we were looking at a protein called acyl carrier protein. Acyl carrier protein normally is, yeah, acylated, right? All right, now listen to this. That acylated protein, okay, when you're studying it on gel electrophoresis, it's going to have a specific mobility according to what looks like its molecular mass. When you add a fatty acid to acyl carrier protein, it changes its mass tremendously. So the protein actually is about uh, 9,800 Daltons, that is the bare naked protein, but you add a fatty acid like, say, palmitic acid, it starts floating around at 15, 16, 17 kilodaltons. And in fact, even the parent protein, it's 9.8, 9.85 kilodaltons. It never runs like that, anyways, because the protein is very strange structure. So just a little heads up. And so when I first discovered that working in the laboratory, I realized that uh, techniques that we were using at the time, which was SDS, page electrophoresis, Western blotting, et cetera, which is still used today, of course, um, can give you um, incorrect ideas of the actual molecular mass of a protein. Just by adding, say, a C16 fatty acid, it looks like it, it's gained a great deal of weight, meaning mass, of course. Like it can look, it was 12K, 12, uh, 12,000 12, 12, Daltons, and it might all of a sudden look like it's uh, 14 and a half. Uh, uh, kilodaltons. So see that, just by adding one fatty acid. So big change. Okay, alkylation, that is the alteration of an alpha or amino, uh, an epsilon amino group, on, on a, and that's going to change the charge density of the protein. Carboxymethylation, that's like the esterification of specific carboxy groups, the ends of the protein. Phosphorylation, mainly modifies serines, threonines, and tyrosines, mainly. Sulfation can occur, that's going to add a strong negative charge. Normally you see that on tyrosine residues. Carboxylation, bringing another negative charge. Sialation, that's carbohydrate, mainly on asparagine, threonine, and serine. Those glycoproteins we're looking at, they can become sialated, right? In fact, the sialation patterns are how uh, the um, flu vaccines work. You know, when you hear about the HNN1, right? Those are specific patterns of glycosylation that are triggering the immune response. Yeah, because there are enzymes called neuraminidase, uh, for example, that alter the sialation pattern of host proteins. And that's how viruses enter, and that's how viruses also can be detected by the immune response, hence how vaccines are targeting. Okay, so sialation is super important in terms of signaling. And then there's just proteolytic processing that we talked about. You can truncate the protein, you can make it smaller, you can add different regions of it. That can, that's going to lead to a big change in isoelectric point, its mass, etc. It functions. All right. Where does this happen? Everywhere. Nucleus, you get acetylation, phosphorylation, lysosome, you get sugar added, you get a formula isolation in the mitochondria, you get N and O link. Those are two different types of pa uh, pattern bonding <laughs> of oligosaccharides. Uh, you talk about N linked and O linked glycoproteins. Sulfation, palmitylation is in the Golgi proteins you find there, the anaplasmic reticulum, sugars. The um, uh, GPI anchor uh, that, again, is a glycosyl phosphatidyl anchor. 
cytosol, you get acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, you get meristylation of the ribosome. That is usually the polyribosome in the cytoplasm. Plasma membrane can have all kinds of glycosylation patterns and GPI anchors. Uh, extracellular fluid, you can get again. Glycosylation is how, that's how proteins are targeted out. Acetylation can target a protein out. Phosphorylation can target a protein out or keep it in. And then, of course, the extracellular matrix, the same story, same business. Even get hydroxylation. Okay? So just to get the idea, it happens basically everywhere. But it's very specific. So there's no randomness to this at all, right? No randomness at all. All right. So it appears stochastic when you just give a generalization, but it's not stochastic. It's not random. It's very precise for the polypeptide. So, okay, here's some examples. Chromatin structure function, you get acetylation. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes here. <clears throat> you acetylate histone residues. You open up chromatin so that it can be recombined. It can be replicated and it can be transcribed. That's a generalization, but basically that's what acetylation can do for many, many genes uh, at histone residues. But you also acetylate proteins themselves in the cytoplasm and proteins themselves in organelles. So it's, a, it's a quite a long-ranging thing. And then, of course, you can deacetylate a protein. Uh, you also get a regulation of mitochondrial processes like phosphorylation. It's very important there for electrotransport chain, and phosphorylation, for amino acid metabolism, fatty acid metabolism, everything that goes on in the mitochondria. Uh, evading the immune system, glycosylation patterns. Viruses put on different glycan trees, and then it doesn't look like it's a virus at all. It looks like a host structure, and it evades the immune response. In fact, not only do viruses do that, but also protozoa and parasites can do that. So glycosylation really important in invading the immune system. Uh, and that's, again, the whole idea of a lot of how uh, immunizations vaccines work. Gene regulation, of course, entire a way that genes expressed either um, through normal processes of transcription or epigenetic control can be corrected or altered by acetylation, methylation, glycosylation, and recognition, of course, big time in the immune response, uh, glycan-associated uh, rec uh, recognition. All right, let's talk now about the uh, uh, acylation, prenylation. Sorry for all this writing, but it's necessary. So here, I'll just go through this. Heterotrimeric GTP binding proteins, those are called G proteins um, regularly, they just say G proteins. And the RAS superfamily of G proteins, which is a subset of all G proteins, are modified by either meristic or palmitic acid, fat, uh, palmitic fatty acid, or by 15 or 20 carbon isoprenoids, and sometimes both. So you need all of that ramification, all that alteration, acylation and prenylation for all those G proteins to work. And if you've been following all of these lectures I give, or even one or two, you know that that's a big thing G proteins are, for example, in central nervous system. You also get numerous cell surface glycoproteins, such as acetylcholinesterase, folate receptor, and they're modified by the C terminus, uh, by, in this particular case, by a glycosylphosphatidylinositol anchor, a GPI anchor. Lipid moiety is crucial to protein function as it can regulate the interaction of an otherwise water soluble protein with membranes. Okay. So this makes the protein more hydrophobic, more lipid soluble, hence it can insert into the membrane, which totally is going to change its function because you change its location. Covalent lipid can also act as a functional switch, resulting in membrane association of certain protein conformations. It can alter the conformation of the protein, such as when you get oligomers forming to form a macro receptor complex in the membrane, something we've talked about recently. We talked about drugs of abuse. And even before that, we're talking about aging and all the other things that we've discussed. So the aggregation of proteins within the membrane also are altered by acylation prenylation, of course, because it's a lipid in a lipid pool, right, in the membrane. Lipid moiety may also aid in the sorting of the protein in membrane domains, that is protein domains and specific domains of the lipid moieties within the membrane. That also includes endosomal trafficking, exosomal trafficking, et cetera, of, of things even like microRNAs. And it promotes lateral and trans bilayer protein, protein, and, and not just protein, protein, but protein lipid and um, RNA protein and RNA lipid interactions. So it's a lot of signaling. So finally, we're going to talk about acetylation, deacetylation. It's just adding acid, that two-carbon acetate. Sirtuins, which I've discussed previously when we were in aging, are NAD, the nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, dependent enzymes. Because they require NAD, that is the oxidized form of that nucleotide, that dinucleotide, every time you think about sirtuins, keep in mind that makes them an excellent link 
to the nutritional status of the organism and all the cellular genetic programs. Why is that? Because the ratio of NAD to NADH regulates things like the TCA cycle, regulates glycolysis, right? It regulates fatty acid oxidation. Bioenergetics, right, rich and large, is controlled by the NAD to NADH levels, but also not just bioenergetics, which that's not big enough, I don't know what it is, but also all the machinery that makes all the different composite changes in amino acid composition because of transamination reactions uh, feeding off the GCA cycle, for example. And of course, the acylation and glypiation and prenylation reactions also are also going to be regulated because of acetylation, deacetylation. So the things that we talked about before, the other parent type of cogent uh, protein post-translational modifications are also dependent on acetylation, deacetylation because it can work directly on DNA that is specifically on DNA or also on the histones, which are cohering with the DNA, specific chromatin regions that is going to go through chromatin remodeling, thus enhancing or sometimes diminishing um, transcriptions. Mammals have seven, seven sirtuins. Remember, these are deacetylases. Three of them are found mainly in the nucleus. Three of them are found in the mitochondria and one in the cytoplasm. Why are they in those locations? Well, because that's where they function. So CERTs 1, 2, 3, 6, and 7 can catalyze deacetylation of protein substrates. CERT 4 has not yet been shown to have any real deacetylase activity, but it seems to do an ADP ribosylation. So on yet another modification of the protein, okay? even though it's a CERT 2 one. CERT-5 was recently demonstrated to have desuccinylase. It's removing a succinic acid from proteins. It's yet another post-translational modification I didn't uh, add to the list. And demalination, we adding malinate, okay, the three-carbon malinate. So you see that there, it just goes on and on and on. So some of the CERTs actually don't just work with acetate. They work with all these other potential chemical substrates for um, post-translational modification or co-translational modification of polypeptides, thus altering their function. Okay, and in fact, CERT-5 does have a deacetylase activity this week. This is just a diagram, and this uh, this comes from my, an annual review of physiology paper published now, uh, oh, not eight years ago, but actually about seven years ago, because these days come out in December, so seven years ago. But this is a really good paper on um, on sirtuins, uh, and the, we, we need a new review article on sirtuins, but this one's actually by a library in Garante. All right, so take a look at this. This is hot topic when people are looking at uh, caloric restriction for age elongation. Now, I talked about this way back in the very early Vera of Med lectures when we're talking about aging. But when you restrict calories across all living domains, you tend to increase the longevity, that is the lifespan of a specific organism. So caloric restriction, of course, caloric restriction also means the opposite of becoming obese, staying lean, right? So caloric restriction is actually generally a very good thing. It's particularly a good thing for omnivorous mammals such as humans who store a lot of fat, as depot fat. So what happens though biochemically from caloric restriction? Lots of things at the hormonal level. Let's just take a look at this. Long go the glasses. I don't know why I need glasses for contrast figures like this, but I do. Must have something to do with why any glasses. Anyway, you've got sirtuins, uh, amp kinase, which I talked about at great length, mTOR, a target of rapamycin, and insulin signaling are all affected by caloric restriction. Um, okay, the, the red or the pink colored uh, uh, part of this diagram is down regulation. So caloric restriction through the signaling system decreases reproductive capacity, decreases the incidence of cancer, can uh, decrease or alter, uh, decrease the negative aspects, negative affect, but basically I just want to say alter mood and behavior. I'm saying uh, the valence is uh, in question, so you'll see why I'm saying that in a minute. Um, also resistance to infections can, go, can be down-regulated, okay? But the metabolic rate is usually increased, and that includes DNA repair, that this is why caloric restriction is probably linked to higher lifespan, because if you repair DNA, less mutations. Uh, it also seems to have an effect on the neurobehavior aggression and anger. And these tend to be sympathetic to health and longevity. And again, this is the same paper. And, you know, this is, this is arguable, but you get the idea of the kind of things we can do at the molecular level when we understand some of the signaling. Now, sirtuins is what we're going to link into. I talked about AMP kinase 
uh, in great length in other discussions. I talked about TOR and mTOR. That's the molecular target of mammalian target of rapamycin. This is tend to work opposite of AMP, by the way. It doesn't work the same way. Insulin signaling also tends to work with TOR. TOR is, uh, again, an anabolic system. Insulin signaling is anabolic, well-fed state. AMP kinase, that's the starvation state or fasting states. Your two ones come up also with caloric restriction. So these are going to be down turned. These are going to be upturned from caloric restriction. All right. So let's take a look now at the search real quickly off of the glasses. CERT-1 is the most studied. It deacetylates and activates the peroxisome proliferative activated receptor gamma coactivator PGC-1-alpha. I know there's a lot of uh, letters of, of the alphabet, but just keep in mind the PPR gamma and PGC-1-alpha are transcription factors. So when you alter their acetylation and you activate, you're activating the expression of a whole host of genes that are under the control of that transcription factor. So it's very globally significant. So that in turn activates, for example, mitochondrial biogenesis, as well as inducing endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So there's an interesting connection between mitochondrial genesis and nitric oxide. I'm going to spend a lot of time on nitric oxide in a subsequent talk. It's going to be probably a two-part lecture, but just to introducing it here, and I've brought it up before. There's also activation of CERT1, which can cause, again, remember it's a deacetylase, deacetylation, but activation of the peroxyproliferate activated receptor alpha. So there are different transcription factors, the gamma and the alpha. That turns on genes required to increase beta oxidation. So remember, this is all about caloric restriction. That's the, that's kind of like, I want to consider that in this, this reference frame for this part of the talk. So beta oxidation is good, right? You're getting fatty acids uh, metabolized. You're breaking down, you're making NADH and FADH2, which can serve in the liver for gluconeogenesis because it's going to make ATP, and ATP is required for gluconeogenesis. You keep the glucose homeostasis going, but also all that reducing power can run through um, electron transport chain to make uh, ATP directly. And we talked about that in the last four uh, lectures. Certain one uh, also activates oxidative metabolism in muscle in the adipose and in the liver to improve insulin sensitivity and to prevent progression of metabolic age associated disorders. So certain one, it just a, it seems like it's a really good player, good player. In the fasting liver, in fact, certain one controls pathways that are responsible for the upregulation of gluconeogenesis. I already told you that because of this whole effect on beta oxidation. You're making reducing power, you need reducing power to make ATP, you need ATP to make sugar from non-carbohydrate precursors of gluconeogenesis is, by the way. In the early stages of fasting, gluconeogenesis is turned on by the CREB, CRTC2. That those are transcription factors. Those are sites for controlling it using the cyclic AMP response element binding protein. That all activates CERT1 transcription. So you start off with fasting to turn on CERT1. First, you turn it on. However, CERT1 activation triggers deacetylation and subsequent ubiquitinylation or ubiquitination, and that degrades the transcription factor CRTC2. So you see, this is feedback control, feedback control. You turn on CERT1, it does all this fantastic stuff for reprogram the cell uh, to start like turning uh, turning on the beta oxidation of fatty acids, ketogenesis, for example, mitochondrial genesis, getting away from uh, storing fat, but breaking down fat. At the same time, the transcription factors that are necessary for CERT1 uh, transcription, they're destroyed. So you don't have the signal always on, the signal's repealed back, see that? Same time, CERT1 deacetylates and activates this PGC1 alpha and the FOXO transcription factors that turns on the genes necessary for all terms uh, or, or all aspects of long term fasting. That's how you survive many, many days without eating. Remember, the humans survived through long periods of feast and famine. That's how our entire metabolic uh, setup works. That's why we store depot fat in times when there's no ready, ready, uh, ready food source. So long-term fasting, uh, which like, hardly ever happens in modern uh, human beings, except in people who are starving, and starving isn't the same as fasting, of course. Starving also involves having what? Uh, a depletion of essentials. That's a lot different than just fasting, right? Uh, but anyway, I just want you to keep in mind that fasting is usually, uh, or was traditionally, evolutionarily, a very common thing for humans. And it isn't now, and that's one of the reasons we have the obesity epidemic, actually. And I mentioned the ketogenesis is triggered, and we already talked about ketogenesis being turned on, for, turned on, for example, in the brain, nucleus accumbens, remember, during uh, cocaine um, stimulation uh, abuse. 
Sirtuins also play an important role in controlling inflammation, which controls numerous age-associated diseases. Both CERT1 and CERT6 suppress the activity of the key activator of inflammation known as nuclear factor kappa B. That's a transcription factor. CERT1 can directly deacetylate the P65 subunit of that protein, of that transcription factor, reduces its ability to activate the transcription of pro-inflammatory genes. So it turns down inflammation. CERT6 also deacetylates histones at the promoters of that gene, and that further represses and therefore suppresses inflammation. CERT1 and CERT6 may work in concert as CERT1 can activate CERT6 transcription by deacetylating and activating the transcriptional machinery, which controls the CERT6 promoter and therefore its nascent transcription. All right. This is the last of a lot of words. I'm sorry for this, but I wanted to get it all in this talk. So let's go through it as quickly as we can. You can always go back and look at this. Mitochondrial sirtuins, not nuclear, govern key aspects of energy metabolism, especially during prolonged fasting. So you got the thing working at the gene level, gene expression level, but also the mitochondria got things happening. So prolonged fasting or caloric restriction, what CR stands for. In addition to its role in fat oxidation, CERT3 promotes the catabolism of acetate and amino acids. For example, it activatingly deacetylates glutamate dehydrogenase, which converts glutamine into alpha-ketoglutarate. Alpha-ketoglutarate, of course, goes directly into the TCA or Krebs cycle. Okay, that's one example. Another recently identified target for CERT3 is lysine 88 on the ornithine transcarbamylase reaction. Deacetylation of that enzyme at that lysine residue at the hot lysine 88 uh, by CERT3 activates the urea cycle and that allows you to dispose of ammonia, which is then essential when energy is produced by amino acid degradation digestion. I brought this up last time. Now I'm bringing in another player. Last, the last lecture, I should say. Another mitochondrial sirtuin, CERT5, can also activate the urea cycle by deacetylating or maybe desuccinylating, because remember, that's more what its uh, substrate specificity is, uh, the key enzyme in uh, the urea cycle, carbamylophosphate synthetase 1. So 3 also deacetylates the HMG-CoA uh, methylglutarocoA synthase. We talked a lot about that pathway, right? That's ketogenesis, right? Yeah. Acetyl-CoA synthase uh, 2 is highly controlled by acetylation. So 3 mediated deacetylation on lysine 635 of that enzyme that allows you to make, okay, acetyl-CoA from acetate. Uh, that's turned on. One target for the CERT, that's where we said acetate metabolism. One target for CERT3 control of fatty acid oxygen is lysine 42 for the long chain fatty acyl CoA dehydrogenase during the beta oxidation reactions. Interestingly, CERT3 activates the mitochondrial pathways that mitigate oxidative damage. For example, CERT3 stimulates the activity of acetate dehydrogenase 2, and that drives the glutathione detoxification system and the activity of superoxide dismutase. And it does so by deacetylating lysines 53, 68, and 122 of that, in, in, uh, that enzyme of the isocitric dehydrogenase 2, ICD, isoform 2. Three different acetates have removed hierarchically from CERT 3, thus removing reactive oxygen because, because of the turning on of glutathione de detox program. Because CERT 3 also deacetylates components of the electron transport chain, it may also reduce the synthesis of the reactive oxygen to begin with. All right, back off the slide, back off the uh, glasses for the slide. This is a paradigmatic slide showing you Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is affected by tau proteins and by the A beta protein. We talked about this at, in at least three other lectures I can think about. And yes, I thought about all three of them when I was putting this together. There is the amyloid precursor protein that sits on the membrane, okay? And that protein gets clipped. Now, if it's clipped by alpha secretase, you get a decreased A-beta plaque formation, which means you get a decrease in the Alzheimer's disease associated plaque formation. If you get the gamma and beta secretase, you make the AB to 42, that's the bad player that increases the plaque formation. Although plaque itself doesn't call Alzheimer's disease, it seems to be associated with it, right? Now that also turns on this microglial uh, transcription system, NF-kappa B, but that actually gets blocked by sirtuins. So right away, you're blocking a pathway that can lead to further Alzheimer's disease molecular symptomology. Now, so 
look at the top. That's that's your um, uh, APP protein, right? Your amyloid precursor protein. Let's look at tau. C2 and 1 deacetylates that protein because you deacetylate that protein, deacetylated tau protein. It can be ubiquitinylated and degraded. Okay, so you don't get neurofibrillary tangle formation because that's what tau proteins do when they oligomerize, polymerize. Now, down here in the nucleus, the 2 and 1 blocks this ROC1 protein, which is a bad player, okay, because it processes, what it does is it promotes this. Uh, a beta 42 pathway, but it also sirtuin deacetylates this retinoic acid receptor beta, which is a transcription uh, factor associated on those genes which have as a cis acting element the RAR sequence homology. That turns on the atom 10. Atom 10 gives you an increase in the alpha secretase processing pathway. Alpha secretase pathway is a good thing, it decreases. Alzheimer's disease. I just said everything that's located here uh, without reading it, but it's there just so that, you know, when you go through these slides, you can get a better, uh, maybe a better writing. I think I said it better than what it says here, but maybe they're uniformly good. All right. Anyway, you see how sirtuins one, base is a two and one, isoform one seems to be ameliorating certain components at the molecular level of Alzheimer's disease. Tau protein mediated neuro neurofibrillary tangles and tau protein and, uh, um, um, uh, amyloid plaque, uh, precursor protein mediated gamma, uh, beta gamma secretase, which is a bad player for Alzheimer's disease. All right. So this is just showing you the same thing. This is from a paper published in Frontiers of Cell Neuroscience. There's the website. For, I mean, there's the link for it. Frontiers in Cell Neuroscience is, uh, op uh, open access. You go to this website, you can read the whole paper. Here's CERT1. It's just showing you what we looked at before. Deacetylates this. Uh, retinoic acid uh, receptor beta allows for atom one. Atom one turns on alpha secretase. Alpha secretase processes the um, amyloid precursor protein via the alpha pathway. Alpha pathway neuroprotecting anti Alzheimer's disease. Uh, when that doesn't happen, you get the beta secretase, then the gamma secretase, uh, secretase is functioning, and you get the nasty. Um, uh, a beta, uh, beta, the 42 kilodalton protein, you get the amyloid B, that's what this is here, and you get Alzheimer's disease. This is just, this is just a skeletonized version of what you saw before. All right. So what else? A couple other things in the brain. Uh, the POMC, remember that's a pro-opioid melanocortin system expressing neurons. If you manipulate the CERT1 by knocking out, you get an increase in MSH. You get increased in thyroid hormone, right? Uh, and T3 levels, reduced energy expenditure, hence more sensitive to diet-induced obesity, okay? This is a good thing, okay? Manipulation, this is a knockout, and yet you look at, it looks like a positive effect. The AGRP expressing neurons, you knock those out, you get decreased response to hunger-inducing hormonal ghrelin, which means you get less uh, of a, a food intake. That might be a good thing. Peripheral uh, tissue neurons, you knock out CERT1, increased insulin sensitivity, insulin receptor. The BSKO mice, a specific knockout mouse, uh, you get a defective somatotrophic signaling, that is growth hormone and uh, insulin-like growth factor one, um, defective caloric restriction response. So this is, is a negative affect. Um, AGRP expressing neurons, overexpression, reduced food intake. So you see, notice that depending on what neurons you're looking at, you get a difference in the outcome. That's the main thing I want to say about this, the end of now this talk practically. That when you think about post-translational, co-translational modification of proteins, I showed you hopefully just a small window at the tremendous complexity here. So you're not just talking about 20,000 genes or, or some small nested set of genes that are expressed in an organism. You're talking about literally millions of different isoforms of proteins because of all the myriad ways you can post-translationally modify them. Okay, That's the real complexity of cellular biochemistry. That's where it's at. But also note that even when you make these global changes and say the expression of a deacetylase, just one of the enzymes controlling one of the pathways for post-translational modification effects in the nucleus, the mitochondria, and the cytoplasm, for example, such as the acetylation pathways, you get opposing effects. You can get anywhere from looks like it's ca causing a diet-induced obesity to causing more energy expenditure, right? You just even looking at the same neurons, you get different um, 
uh, observations in the, in the research, okay, in, in the research literature. So this has not been sorted out. That's what I'm telling you. And you can find this again on that, on that link. All right. Now, I'm going to go through three very quick. These are basically extracted from the abstracts of three papers. Journal of Neuroscience, 2016, August, okay? Resveratrol, that's the uh, plant polyphenolic compound that we've talked about previously. It actually activates CERT1, so it in induces deacetylation, directly infusing resveratrol bilaterally into the nucleus accumbens increases depression and anxiety like anxiety like behaviors in this animal model conversely intra nucleus accumbens infusions of this compound which is a cert antagonist so now you're antagonizing the deacetylase which means you're leaving the acetates wherever they were reduces those behaviors what behaviors depression anxiety like so X527 also reduced acute stress responses in stress-naive mice, again, an animal model. Increased CERT1 levels directly in the nucleus accumbens in these mice by use of a viral-mediated uh, gene expression system also increases, because you're increasing the amount of CERT1, depression and anxiety in those mice when you're doing a particular test that's been, you know, it's open field, elevated plus maze and four swim tests. These are all ways of looking at, are these mice depressed or anxious? Okay. Sometime I'll go through these. These are uh, psychiatry, psychology type of tests done with animals. They're kind of interesting, actually. I don't know how much they really map onto human behavior, human neurophysiology, but they've been used. Now, using a Cree lock system, which allows you to turn on and off gene expression, Again, using a viral vector system to overexpress and then turn on, turn off CERT1 selectively in the dopamine D1 or D2 subpopulations of the medium spiny neurons in the nucleus accumbens. I'm very in a very tight location within the nucleus accumbens, only in those dopaminergic pathways. Check this out. Okay. In that D1 or D2 population of those medium spiny neurons of the nucleus accumbens, Promotes depressive-like behaviors only when overexpressing the CERT1 in the D1 medium spiny neuron, not in the D2, no effect at all. Okay, so very specific effects. Next paper uh, abstract, which I'm dissecting here, abstract, uh, I'm selectively dissecting what was in the abstract. This is in Molecular Psychiatry, published a couple years ago, 2015. Bilateral infusions of HDAC inhibitor, that's histone deacetylase inhibitor, like a sirtuin, into the central amygdala attenuated anxiety-like behavior resulting from an elevated, what's that? Cortisol exposure. So cortisol is, is high levels in depressed humans in the blood. So it's believed that high levels of cortisol in the blood is linked to, for example, probably indirectly, but it's linked to, it's characterizing major depressive disorder and also maybe some anxiety disorder. So from that resulting elevated cort uh, cortisol level, okay, if you infuse an inhibitor of the sirtuin, you attenuate anxiety-like behavior. In fact, there is an apparent novel pathway through which histone deacetylation contributes to cortisol regulation of what? The glucocorticoid receptor, which is where cortisol binds, and the subsequent what? Cortical releasing factor expression in the amygdala. So this is now regulating how cortisol is synthesized, a huge feedback loop, looking at the receptor for it and also the, the, the release factor, which ultimately controls the cortisol synthesis and release. So specifically, deacetylation of histone 3 at lysine 9, we, we fondly call that H3K9, through the coordinated action of the NAD-dependent protein deacetylase sirtuin-6 and the nuclear kappa factor kappa-beta, okay, kappa-beta, the one we talked about before. So deacetylation through that sirtuin sequesters the glucocorticoid receptor expression, leading to a disinhibition of CRF. When you disinhibit the CRF, what do you think happens? It turns back on. And when it turns back on, what do you make? More cortisol. Cortisol is linked to depression. You see how that works. So that is when the deacetylation is on through CERT6 here, what happens is it looks like 
way downstream, it could be promoting the, depress the depression uh, state of these animals. Therefore, epigenetic, because these are epigenetic phenomena not happening at the nucleotide sequence level, right? These are modifications of the histones, part of the histone code uh, of the chromatin. Epigenetic programming in the amygdala, specifically histone modifications, okay, might be important in the maintenance of chronic anxiety and pain. So see, this is a totally different thing, right? So here we're talking about amygdala. Last time we are talking about nucleus accumbens. It's different regions of the brain might function differently with deacetylation patterns, which alters covalent modification of polypeptides. However, now here's a third paper, published again in a very prominent journal, Biological Psychiatry, uh, only, uh, yeah, a little over a year ago. So December 2016, this is March 2018. So what's that, uh, I don't know, 15 months ago. Chronic stress reduced CERT1 activity in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. It's the third region of the brain now we're looking at. Nucleus accumbens, amygdala, now we're looking at the hippocampus. Pharmacologic and genetic inhibition of hippocampal CERT1 function led to an increase, increase in depression-like behaviors when it's functioning in the hippocampus, okay? Conversely, CERT1 activation, when you activate it, you can activate that deacetylase enzyme, blocks both the development of depression-related phenotypes and the aberrant dendritic arborization structures, which we talked way back when we talked about tetrahydrocannabinol, elicited by chronic stress exposure. So here's a big however, a big caveat Latin, the Latin however. What does it mean? It means that depending on what region of the brain you're looking at, sirtuin activity, either up or down, can, can 180 change this far downstream readout. What is the downstream readout? Uh, a psychiatric measure. Okay, so that's pretty amazing. So that means you can't just come up with a drug and say we're going to inhibit sirtuins and we think that's going to be a good drug for uh, uh, attacking major depressive disorder or anxiety, because it might well be if that drug makes it to the hippocampus, you'll be doing the opposite, because you want sirtuin activity, at least certain isoforms of it. So what's the basic dialectic from all of this then? Okay, we looked at all these different global possibilities of changing proteins. I only just, I just did that survey. It was like watching the parade go down the street, the St. Joseph's Day parade going down the street in, in South Side of Chicago, in the old Italian neighborhoods, the lit you're looking at this, you're saying, oh, wow, there's glycosylation, there's ubiquitin elation, there's phosphorylation, there's methylation, acetylation, succinylation, there's then the removal of those, there's acylation, prenylation, glypiation, et cetera, et cetera, malination. Covalent modification, such as acetylation, that's the one we keyed in on at the end, can play a greater role in functional activation alteration and transcription alone. So just having a gene transcribed, you would think, well, that all the work is done for the cell. You've made this particular protein. You'll derive now a pathway or, or a cell fate. Well, that can happen, but look at all the subtle modifications, all of the what I like to call amplitude and frequency modulation of the cell. So some core neurological pathways are controlled by acetylation. We just briefly discussed that there. Variation of acetylation signature helps explain real-time control, real-time, because you think about it, this acetylation, deacetylation happens in the matter of seconds. And because you're affecting a protein, and the protein can have a turnover number of, say, uh, a half a million molecules in uh, uh, 10 seconds, then you're going to have a big C change in the signal transduction cascade, right? In the waterfall of activities that could directly at the molecular level act as an endophenotype for a macro level. For example, for things like a readout, like a neuropsychiatry. These are real-time events, right? Not the slow process of synthesizing a protein. And from transcript to protein, that can take several minutes. So think about how a person's attitude changes quickly. You go from being in a great mood to being in a really bad mood, what, in a split second. That is, if you want to look at a molecular signature for that, now we're there. See, now you're starting to look at it. Isn't that cool? Now, I want to say something here, okay? There's epigenetic paradigm shifts. That's what we we're just discussing. And I want to say that from just looking at those three abstracts, and I chose those three, but 
you can find a lot of examples like that where they seem to differ 180, right? Uh, they seem to contradict one another, right, in the square of opposition. But do they contradict? Not necessarily, because you're looking at different times. So when you say um, A, uh, or whenever A occurs, B occurs, it can't be happening at the same place in time that whenever A occurs, B does not occur. But maybe when A occurs, B occurs sometimes, and when A occurs, B, occur, B doesn't occur sometimes apparently altering the contradictive state of a square of opposition and in, in, uh, um, logic and categorical logic. But it's not because we're not, defi we're not defying anything at all. We're talking about different time and place. Hippocampus versus amygdala versus nucleocumbens, for example, within those regions, within dopaminergic circuits within that system, right? You have different effects just on one sirtuin. Right? Yeah. So here's what I want to say. It's dangerous to perform a sweeping induction about sirtuins, just sirtuins here, but we can talk about any of these covalent modifications, uh, and the role in abnormal neuropsychiatry. Now, if it's dangerous to perform a sweeping induction, a generalization of what we think sirtuins are doing, it is dangerous. I just showed you that. It's probably also dangerous to think that we understand a whole lot about what those molecular endophenotypes are and the very, very complex organ the brain, the central nervous system. And in fact, what drugs do long term to that system, such as chronic drugs of abuse, like marijuana, ethanol, cocaine, and of course, the opiates, discussing the opiate epidemic. Okay, that I'm going to leave you with now. Nice red again for St. Joseph's Day. Again, I'm Dr. Dan Guerra. There is my email address. Contact me directly on this lecture or any other ones. There's my Facebook where you can find this lecture. I'll post it later today and all the other um, YouTube video lectures for Vera of Med. Uh, there is the Vera of Med email address. Contact us there. We would love to have you as a client. There's our website. And remember, we are scientists verifying published evidence in medical bioscience. That's just what I did for you. Again, that's the continental divide. All right. So what's left? I only took off these glasses. I could have taken them off a while back. Let's uh, close this off and let's do our normal sign off for today like we always do. Um, bye for now.